In this video I look at the value of stepping back and considering one's overall photographic archive and investigating how individual projects relate to a wider vision. I think that all photographers go through that self-questioning process of wondering whether what they are doing has any wider meaning or that feeling that everything they produce has a generic overtone or that they lack a distinctive visual voice. The way that I look at any photographer's overall contribution or output is do I get a sense of that photographer through their work? While thinking about this subject, I try to structure my thoughts into a user-friendly model. So for the sake of simplicity, I'll look at four tiers of awareness about photographer's work that need attention. The structure is a bit like a pyramid. At the base of the pyramid are all the photographs that one takes. In terms of focus, this tier is limited to the time that one is actively trying to make a photograph. The next level up contains all the images that one would consider as personal work. So that is work that has significance to you or when you purposely try to capture something that goes beyond the surface information. The next tier up can be seen as your themes or projects. I've always worked on long-term projects because I found that for me it's the only way that I can feel that I'm immersed in a subject and without this layer I feel that one's operating solely within the base tier. An analogy would be continually producing catchphrases for advertising campaigns compared to say researching and writing a book. Magazine and Instagram culture has shifted the focus of photography to the quick dopamine hit that one gets from seeing an impactful image, but these images seldom have a shelf life beyond the immediate. I only really begin to appreciate a photographer's work when I see how any particular image fits into their wider vision. If you consider the photographs of, say, Mary Ellen Mark, you immediately recognize how her images fit into her wider life quest. It doesn't matter if she was photographing circus acts or street children, you can feel her presence within her work. You know that what she's doing comes from a very definite source. And it's this core that I consider to be the top tier of the pyramid. It's the sense that a viewer gets from appreciating a photographer's collected moments of communication over their lifetime of work. Discovering one's source of inspiration is not achieved through a strategy or concept. It starts off by recognizing what subjects you are drawn to and then trying to articulate how you intend to communicate about those subjects. During my own process, I always attempted to hold in mind all the upper layers of the pyramid while taking photographs, but not in a formulaic manner, but in an unfocused recognition kind of way. However, every now and again, I would feel that I'm untethered from my source of inspiration. And there's no mechanical formula to get back on track. It's generally not something that one can hurry. I usually just let myself off the hook and wait until I'm excited about work again. It's probably a bit like writer's block. Recently, I was given a great opportunity to reassess what I've been up to for the last 30 years when a French documentary crew came out to South Africa to look at some of my body's work and also how my approach has changed along with the country's transformation. The act of revisiting previous locations that I've been interested in and the need to articulate my process has been incredibly useful in reviewing my own pyramid. During this video, I'll concentrate on the top tier. Obviously, all the other levels are important, but I'll come back to those in other videos. While continuing on this topic, I'll include visuals from the making of the documentary and also include images from the three essays that they've highlighted. Pierre-Francois, Parisian director, cam cameraman, Fred behind and bodyguards lurking and watching our every move. So what are you hoping to get on this trip? 13 minute story on you, Graham. And we're starting here in inner city, Johannesburg, Hillbrow, Mabenang, 
because we want to understand your trajectory as a photographer. Trying to understand how you started as a news photographer, eventually transitioning to street photography and documentary photography, capturing the changes that were happening in South Africa back then. And tomorrow, together, we're going to go to Karoo, and then we're going to move on in terms of location, but we're also going to move on in terms of thematic, move on in your work, uh, how you always try in various different approaches to capture the spirit of South Africa in terms of people, society, landscape, trying to understand that very, very complex country. It's not that all the great photographers that we appreciate had the foresight to see the bigger picture of their careers right from the outset, but somehow consciously or unconsciously, they became aware of how their photographs are interconnected and applied the principle of compound interest. A banker would tell you that the interest from your investments will be added to your total and you will gain interest from that interest. In developing a photographic theme over time, you get the same result. Each stage of inquiry helps one to delve deeper into a subject, and for viewers of that work, they are able to recognize the process and follow the journey and share your interest. I think that a good way of looking at a lifetime of photographic work is to compare it to a symphony. I'll try to remove anything pompous about that statement. A good photograph is probably like a strong music riff and a long-term project can be seen as a melody or poem, while your intention for your total body of work could, if curated correctly, resemble a symphony. When you visit a museum or gallery and they've curated a brilliant retrospective of a photographer's work, you come away feeling like you've experienced the full orchestra with each musician contributing to a combined harmonious sound. I remember seeing a retrospective of Walker Evans at the Pompidou in Paris. I'd always appreciated his work from the books that I'd seen, but witnessing the progression of his life's work within one space and understanding his dedication to subject matter completely shifted my understanding of what he had achieved. Just as in music, there's a rhythm that one can achieve by working in a cyclic manner. Returning again and again to themes and even locations allows one to experience a subject in a deeper manner. The places as well as one's point of view shifts over time. So the idea is not to repeat oneself, but rather to deepen the interest within the subject. In psychology, they talk about the repetition compulsion in which one returns repeatedly to situations in order to learn something that one hasn't quite grasped. Probably the best musical example that mirrors this process is Bach's Goldberg Variations. The melodic theme is stated at the beginning of the piece and then goes through 30 variations before returning again to the original melody. You can also feel how we respond to the rhythm of primitive tribal drum music, even the verse-chorus structure of pop songs. If you break down Deep Purple's Smoke on the Water, they introduce a chorus early on and then head off to tell you a whole lot of stuff that is separate but related to the chorus, and then they return again to the chorus and repeat the process. So it becomes storytelling on multiple levels. You introduce the theme, then broaden the view, then return to reinforce and hold together the overall storyline. Another subtle process that ties work together is hyperlinking. And this can be seen within individual photographs, essays, and also within the total theme. It's often unconscious, but it's worth acknowledging these moments when you recognize that you're taking a photograph that links possibly to other photographs within other essays, and then understanding what that link means to what you've done before. As long as one's not repeating oneself in an explicit manner, these moments are reassuring because they affirm that one is engaging with the subject in a comprehensive manner. These links will automatically emerge if one is photographing authentically.
By that I mean that one's objective for photographing comes from a place that's one's own, rather than merely trying to make photographs that look a certain way or replicate someone else's work. So the idea is not to burden oneself with a whole lot of thinking while you're photographing. It's more a process of making what you're trying to do conscious and then trusting that this setting of intent will hold in one subconscious and that will direct how you work. The author Cormac McCarthy said, writing is very subconscious and the last thing that you want to do is think about it. I read somewhere that he would sit down to write and just say out loud to his muse or his subconscious something like, okay, I'm here, let's write. It's probably true of all great creative production. A great storyteller or movie will introduce an idea, then open things up, but always give one enough links to hold the whole piece together. The work flops if the ideas are not held together sufficiently, or it becomes boring because it's too repetitive, and you continue to say the same thing without adding depth or variation. The reason for creating structure to the way that one approaches photography is to allow the freedom for spontaneity to enter one's work. If it becomes too rigid, then the work becomes sterile, and if there are no boundaries at all, then there's nothing holding the work together. Even photographers like William Eggleston or Wolfgang Tillmans, who have explored the democratic forest of images, they are still operating within the boundary of that exploration, and they also have a recognizable aesthetic. The latest understandings from brain research are that the most optimally creative position is to straddle the left-right brain divide. So while you're creating boundaries or editing the individual stages of work, then one's activating the left brain. You're being critical and you're trying to create form or sequence, then when you're out photographing, you want the right brain to dominate and it must have free reign. The left brain is just useful to keep you safe and bring you back when you've strayed too far. I don't feel that there should be any fixed rules about holding one's work together. Some photographers choose a very distinctive style or look to their work. I tend to treat visual language like any other tool like, say, choice of format or theme. Probably for me, my overriding motive has been the communication of how I feel about the society that surrounds me, and then the challenge becomes finding a way of expressing the complexity of that feeling. I've now returned home after this trip with Pierre, Fred and Rodney. It turned out to be a great opportunity to take a hard look at my own trajectory and perhaps to gain some momentum for my future photography. I hope you enjoyed coming along on the journey and please like and subscribe and I'll see you next time.